Sin is a word that probably makes you feel uncomfortable, maybe even a little embarrassed in church circles, but actually it's really important for us to understand. None of us like to be called an expert in sin, do we? But actually, you know, most of us are much better at sin than we like to admit. But actually, I want to say that sin is something that's really serious. Let's talk about what sin means. Sin is about transgressing God's divine law. It's about breaking the commandments that God has given us. Perhaps that might be deliberately, perhaps that could be willfully, or perhaps it might be unknowingly and regrettably. Perhaps it's some way that we've lost control or some lapse in behaviour. Ultimately, sin is about an action in breach of a relationship. God has a relationship with us and we've sinned against him, we've broken that relationship. And that's where we most keenly feel sin, isn't it? When we do something to hurt someone else that damages our relationship, perhaps with someone we love, our wife, our friend, perhaps somebody in our family. And of course, sin could be something big that people see as sin. It could be something very small that no one else knows about except you but it's still sin. What does the Bible talk about sin? Well, it talks about sin, uh, the origin of sin in human life. And how does it talk about this? Well, it tells us about the fall. It tells us how they, the first humans, Adam and Eve, had such an amazing close relationship with God. They lived in a perfect world. They saw him face to face. They walked in the same garden that he walked in and he'd provided for them abundantly. But he had made a command of them, and that was to not pick the fruit of a tree, not to, to not take a piece of fruit off the tree that he had commanded them not to take off. And of course, we know the story. Though they knew that command, they knew that was what God didn't want them to do because of the influence of the serpent, the devil, they were persuaded they were tempted to disobey, and they made the choice to disobey God. They plucked off the fruit and ate it. We see the world becoming corrupt, and eventually God flooding the entire world and saving only one family. But God goes on, he's so merciful, and he chooses a person called Abraham. He chooses Abraham, and he chooses him to bless not because of anything that Abraham did. Abraham was a sinful man. He did many things that were wrong. And yet God chose him to bless him and make him into a great nation. And God follows the course of this nation as they grow into a people. And then God gives them the law under Moses at Mount Sinai. Again, God is merciful, like he did in the Garden of Eden where he saw Adam and Eve face to face. He speaks with Moses face to face and he gives them the law. He gives them the Ten Commandments, which not only are they from him, but actually written by him. And it's important for the people of Israel, the people of God, to remember that when they've got these commandments, that they're binding, they've made a commitment, a covenant with God. And actually what's attached to that covenant? Well, if you obey it, I will bless you, God says in Deuteronomy chapter 30. But if you disobey it, you will perish. And the rest of the story of the Old Testament is about how the people of God struggle to obey the law, to keep the law. Sometimes they do well and they experience some blessing through the grace of God. Other times, and to be honest, this is most of the time in the, in the Old Testament, they go through really hard times because they've forgotten to obey God and they've gone after the gods of the nations around them. They've experienced real trouble and in fact eventually their land is taken over by foreign armies, by foreign kings, and all seems to be lost. But you know, the people of God continue to try and follow his law, mostly failing, admittedly, but they continue to try and follow it. And by the time of Jesus, the Romans are in power over the land of Israel. And there are some then, as part of the people of God, who feel that they are obeying the law so well, doing really well to obey the law. But actually Jesus teaches them what obeying the law really is all about. He shows them in his example what it's about, but he also teaches them through his words. 
that actually obeying the law, not sinning, is a matter of the heart. He teaches in Matthew 5, he talks about some of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and he shows that actually the law is much stricter than people ever thought it was, than actually the teachers of the law at the time thought it was. He gives various examples. He talks in Matthew 5 about murder and adultery, and he says that actually this law is addressing more than just the act of murder. Of course it's sinful to kill someone. Of course it's sinful to commit adultery, to sleep with someone who isn't your married uh, husband or wife. Of course that's wrong, but Jesus says it's more than that. Actually, it's wrong to think an angry thought about your brother, to call your brother a fool, to insult your brother. You see, Jesus is interpreting the law as it really should have been interpreted. It's a bit like, for instance, if at home perhaps you have a gas fire or an open fire and you have a child come to you, perhaps a son or a daughter or a granddaughter, grandson, and you say to them, look, I'm, I'm popping out to the kitchen, don't touch the fire. You go and make a cup of tea. And as you come back holding the tea in your hand, you see them holding a stick, burning the end of the stick in the fire. And you're angry, aren't you? But actually, they could legitimately say to you, well, you just told me not to touch the fire. You didn't say that I couldn't put a stick in the fire. But of course, we don't mean that, do we? When we say don't touch the fire, we mean more than that. We mean don't go too close to the fire. Don't put anything in the house in the fire don't mess with the fire. In the same way, when God says do not murder, he means more than that. And I don't know about you, but when you hear this, I find my conscience pricked. Because actually, none of us cannot be angry with a brother, can we? Can we really do that? You know, what Jesus says in Matthew 5 about sin covers so much of what we do without knowing it. The gossip that we talk about, the people we talk about behind their backs, our road rage, the way we dismiss other people as nobodies. That's what sin is, Jesus says. And he says, you know, he says that your righteousness must exceed the Pharisees. These were the guys who tithed their herbs. They, were, they did everything to follow the law. And yet Jesus says, Following the law is about absolute purity. It's about your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. And he also says that sin is really serious. It's not a trivial matter. He says that you'll be subject to judgment, to the council, to hell, if you do these things, if you're angry. Don't you feel like I do, actually? You know, that's what I deserve. My conscience has been moved by what Jesus says, actually, you know, when you're angry, you deserve judgment. When you call someone a fool, insult one, dismiss someone, you deserve hell. And Jesus goes on and says, actually, sin is so serious that if your hand causes you sin, chop it off. If your eye causes you sin, pluck it out. That's how serious Jesus is about sin. And of course, he doesn't want us to take that literally because if he wanted us to take, if, if, if we were to take that literally, well, I tell you, before you now, you'd have a man with no hands and no eyes. Romans 6 says, the wages of sin is death. It's a serious problem for us, isn't it? Because I don't think I can live up to the strictness of God's law. I don't think I can live up to God's interpretation given by Jesus at the Sermon of the Mount and shown by Jesus in the way he treats people. You see, he was, is our ultimate example of purity, of doing what's right, of avoiding sin. Why do people need to understand that we sin? Well, most people, as I've said, think, you know, um, most people think, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm not that bad, you know. I try and do good, you know, I don't hurt anyone, but we've already heard from what Jesus says, actually, you know, it goes beyond doing outward things, it's about our hearts. People need to know this because it's the truth. And God calls us to share the truth. It's important that we share with them the truth. Romans again says, for all have, fallen sh for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
thing is, how can we call them to repentance as Jesus, as John the Baptist, as the apostles did, unless they know that they're sinners? You know, when I was younger, I used to think I was pretty good. When I was a child, I used to read my Bible, go to church. I had a loving family who supported me in that, which I'm so grateful for. But you know, I, I used to do, I used to think I was doing really well. But you know, when I got into my teens, I realized that I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Why did I realize that? And why did I reach out to God? Well, because I was conscious of my sin. I realized that actually, you know, I mess up and I willfully do things that are wrong that hurt my father's heart. That's what brought me into a real relationship with God, knowing that I had done wrong. And that's why people outside our church walls need to know that as well. Because it's only when they know that they're in need that they will come to Jesus as their saviour. This is something that's urgent as well. They need to know that it's urgent, that they need to come to God for mercy. When we tell people, we should never be those who tell them like the Pharisees told them. The Pharisees who thought they'd got it all sorted, but we should tell them as people who are sinners as well, as people who acknowledge that we get angry, that we lust with our mind, that we do many, many different things to not give glory to God. In fact, we should be the people who are more conscious of our sin. People should never say about us, oh, they're holier than thou. They should, people should see in us that repentant hearts, people who know that they've got it wrong, but come to Jesus as their saviour. So we've seen that we all sin and actually that we all need to acknowledge that we sin so that we can come to, to know the Saviour. And I'm reminded when I'm talking about sin of a story that I think Spurgeon tells, an experience that Spurgeon had. He went to a city and he had two evenings where he was preaching. The first evening he preached about sin and he convicted the people of their sin so strongly. And the following night he was going to preach about salvation, about how their sins can be dealt with. But you know what happened in that city that night? A big fire happened and many of the people who were sat in the congregation on the first night were killed. And Spurgeon vowed from that day that he would never speak about sin unless he also spoke about salvation. And of course, it's a big danger when we're splitting up God's story that we're not able to tell the whole thing all in one go, are we? We can only tell a small bit. And so this bit's been about sin, but the next bit's about redemption. And so I'd really urge you, if, if you felt moved, if you felt convicted, to speak to one of the leaders of your local church about this. To speak to them about how your sin can be dealt with. Don't leave it for another day or for next week. But go and speak to them, ask to them, ask them about how you can receive salvation because of Jesus Christ. And I know that next week you're going to be looking at the redemption story, about how redemption is part of God's big story. And I hope you'll be able to join us then as well.